First of all, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And uh, somebody asked me amongst the audience, what is ECROM? So for those of you who do not understand or know what ECROM stands for, ECROM is the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, Rome. It was founded in 1959. The decision to found ECROM was taken in New Delhi in a UNESCO general conference uh, when the world felt that there is a need for a center uh, after the destruction in the Second World War to specifically a technical body to look into the um, area of conservation of cultural heritage to advise member states on uh, conservation of cultural heritage. And in 1959, we found a home in Rome, and that's the main head office of ICROM. And uh, we have over 133 member states, and Sweden is one of the member states of ICROM. I would like to thank all of my previous speakers for giving us a very rich and a very good day and uh, leading up to this point and giving me an opening into my topic, which is how do you build capacity for something which is unexpected? And how do you make value judgments amidst a humanitarian crisis? So the, my presentation is divided in three parts. One is, why protect cultural heritage? What is the value of protecting cultural heritage when so many lives are in danger? What are the global challenges vis-a-vis -vis disaster risk management in general and disaster risk management for cultural heritage? And finally, in response to these global challenges, how ECROM is developing capacity development, capacity building initiatives all around the world. So I would like to start with the question of why preserve cultural heritage. And uh, this is an image that I would like to share, if I can, all around the world, of uh, Nicole Armenta, Nicolette Armenta, sorry, uh, a colleague uh, whom we met in uh, Porto Prince, Porto Prince in Haiti in 2010. I had the opportunity to lead ICROM training there for post-disaster recovery in Haiti after the earthquake. And Nicolette, on the first day of the training, brought this voodoo flag. And she said uh, that she had suffered personal losses. She had lost her family members, she had lost her friends. But despite these personal losses, she had brought this voodoo flag from the rubble of the voodoo temple nearby because this voodoo flag gave her the hope to continue, to continue and to build a future for her country, and it gave strength to her community. So that's what cultural heritage is. It's a lesson that I learn every day when I go out and try to work in, a, in the middle of a, a big crisis and uh, it's the image of Nicolette, which gives me hope, inspiration, and makes me believe that culture cannot fit. It is an important ingredient for rebuilding, for building back better, from recovering from disasters. And it is also now we are finding with research a resource for disaster risk reduction. So let's look at the global challenge of disasters. I just want to share some data with you. 2.9 billion people have been affected by natural disasters, according to a study which was released by the United Nations Agency for Disaster Risk Reduction. And since 1980, there has been 233% increase in extreme weather events. And the regions that are most affected are Asia and North America. And this is a picture from my native state, Jammu and Kashmir, in 2014, where devastating floods hit the entire state. Then there is this other side of the picture, the intentional destruction of cultural heritage, something that we are witnessing in Iraq, in Syria. But there are more than 20 countries that are going through conflict 
And many of these conflicts, in fact, most of these conflicts are ethno-religious in nature. And increasingly, targeting cultural heritage has become a new strategy for waging war. And 7.6 pe million people are affected by conflicts all around the world. And some of them have been, many of them have been displaced out of their countries and some internally. Moreover, there is a trend of complex emergencies. What we are witnessing is our complex emergencies that occur due to untreated risk. We have been talking all morning about risk, uh, risk assessment, risk management, risk preparedness, but there is always residual risk and there is always untreated risk, accumulative risk or cumulative risk. Evident in the Tohoku earthquake in Japan, a highly organized, risk-prepared, risk-aware society. But we had an earthquake, we had a tsunami, we had fire and then nuclear radiation. This can happen, the worst, the unexpected can happen. There is also this interaction between conflicts and natural disasters. There is a very big pattern now emerging that countries that have been going through years of war are more exposed to natural disasters. Even a small rain, or a, not even a small rain, I mean a storm, can turn into a big disaster. And moreover, if there is inadequate aid in the situation of a natural disaster, it can lead to conflicts. So this is something that we should consider while recovering heritage. And I do not mean only institutional heritage. I also mean heritage that exists beyond institutions, heritage that is not formally recognized. And in many countries, we have such situations. But on the other hand, disasters also provide an opportunity to bring peace and development as was possible in Banda Aceh in tsunami during the, after the tsunami in 2004, when there was an opportunity to broker peace and deliver assistance. That peace lasted for 10 years because the politics failed to deliver. So <laughs> that's something we have to keep in mind. So just to give you an idea, complex emergencies resulting due to conflicts and disasters have some similarities. They are multifaceted, humanitarian and cultural crises. The similarity in type and scale of damage to cultural heritage is there. I mean, I showed you that earlier picture where you had one photograph from Syria and one from Philippines. The level and scale of damage is there, the similar. Oh, sorry. But it requires coordinated response that goes beyond the capacity or mandate of a single agency. And that is what is very, very important. And that's where cultural heritage sector needs to build that capacity to work outside of the cultural heritage sector with other actors. Then we have our own institutional challenges. We've been hearing all this morning the idea of incorporating risk management in day-to-day -day functioning is a challenge. That's why. We are sitting here, and I am very happy to bring this uh, image from Ta from Cambodia. And then as a sector, we, lo we really lack capacity for preparedness, response, and recovery in complex emergency situations. We had Haiti in 2010. In the same year, we had Pakistan. Floods were, you know, and um, a World Heritage Site uh, was... Uh, you know, in danger, but the international community did not have the capacity to respond to the two disasters in the same year. So this is at an international level, but even at a national level, I haven't seen uh, much capacity, even uh, countries like Japan needed in the end, in Tohoku earthquake, they needed help from outside. Not that it was advertised widely, but later on colleagues from Japan did share this information with us. Ikram has been 
developing training actively for quite some time in this area, but in the past 10 years, we are very much involved with uh, developing courses, international courses in Japan and in Rome. We've had nine international courses on disaster risk management of cultural heritage in Ritsumeikan University, with Ritsumeikan University in Japan. And we've, uh, in, from 2010 to 12, we organized three international courses on first aid to cultural heritage in times of conflict. These were specifically for conflict dealing with complex, complex emergencies. And then since then, we have had first aid courses in Haiti, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Colombia, and Moldova. I'm going to now highlight some of the key approaches of ECROM training in these courses. First is a very multidisciplinary approach to training. We bring development professionals, humanitarians, archaeologists, legal experts, architects, curators, conservators, as well as uh, uh, people who are uh, more like planners and policy makers sometimes to our courses. And they are as invited both as participants and as uh, members of the course team. Somebody asked this morning about uh, other actors. So this is an important ingredient uh, of risk assessment, like the first step towards risk assessment before getting down in a disaster situation. One has to understand the context, what's the location, who owns the cultural heritage policies, legal framework, the root cause of the damage because earthquake is the first one, and the, but then heritage is exposed to other things and the society, the politics. Who are the actors who can help? And here actors are many, like the military, the Red Cross, the UN agencies, if they are on the ground and active, the people who give food. And one has to understand what are their interests, what are the their interrelationships, and how they can influence heritage. Sometimes if there is somebody who wants to clear the road, for example, if the UNDP wants to get in there and clear roads, maybe they are the people we need to work with because we need access to that heritage. And then we have to understand what is the interest of UNDP in helping us to do that. So that's, that's situation analysis and it normally should happen actually together in the room with other actors present, if possible. And to do that, one has to have some peacetime preparation done beforehand to understand who would be the contact point for United Nations Development Programme in case there is going to be a, if, the, if there is a big emergency in your country or in your area. Then heritage and conflict, it's a special subset there is this whole issue of intentional targeting, how heritage becomes part of the conflict ideology. So we do conflict analysis, and this is a well-recognized tool within the political science uh, uh, you know, area of uh, political science, but not something that we heritage people are used to. So we bring people who specialize in conflict resolution studies to do this kind of work with us and analyze again in real case situations how heritage can be implicated in a, in a conflict situation. Integration with wider disaster risk management field is important because if I'm sitting in a room with actors who speak a different language, it's a big problem. So terminology is very important and actively we are trying to promote uh, you know, the same uh, definition of disaster that is used outside. It's not disaster in terms of value, but it's disaster as a social disruption. So that's very important. Methods for risk assessment. We have very peculiar methods for risk assessment, very particular methods for risk assessment, but the RCE, CCI, uh, and ECROM method can be applicable, but still there are discrepancies, and this is something that we are trying to test through our various training programs, trying to get some consistency. Coordination and collaboration. Again, how do we talk with various agencies? We, how do we navigate their interests? So this is again a, part, a big topic in the training and legislation. 
I'll come back to legislation again. For managing complex emergency, the notion of risk is introduced amidst an unfolding crisis. So one major risk is realized, earthquake has happened. This is a picture from Philippines. How secondary hazards would come into play, how they would reach the heritage, what are the pathways, what are the risk pathways, and how can we block them. So that's how we introduce risk management in an ongoing emergency situation. International and domestic legislation for the protection of cultural heritage is a very important topic. Often we have one, just we, normally we, speaking, we have one, one big convention, which is the 1954 Hague Convention, but that's for conflicts. We do not have a legislation or an international convention for natural disasters. But in countries, there is domestic legislation sometimes, which can be very effective. Sometimes, some domestic legislation meant for natural heritage can also lend protection to cultural heritage. And we want to be very bold. We are, in, through our courses, through our discussions with our participants, the ideas have come up, maybe national legislation should look into connecting good risk assessment with institutional funding. Maybe the institution that hasn't done its homework, that hasn't completed its inventory, should not get government funding. Maybe something that harsh a punitive measure will make us sit up and prepare for the you know, unexpected. Damage assessment is another aspect of uh, our trainings, and this is actually a reality. Uh, we just had a very interesting talk by my co former colleague, Jose Luis, on value assessments. Here, value assessment is very important, but often institutions haven't done their homework. So when you go in a situation where there, is, uh, there are buildings that are, you know, totally down or some buildings that are livable still with minor treatments. We try to do damage assessment with cost of treatments. We equate how much treatment costs, how many, you know, would it, would it require a major treatment, minor treatment, or, you know, with my very my little repair, the building can be livable or not. This is again an area where then in ultimately costs lead you to the issue of value. And uh, right now, United Nations Development Program and World Bank have come up with a uniform framework for post-disaster needs assessment, which is actually the source of funding for rebuilding and reconstruction. Culture is nowhere there. UNESCO is trying to get, get culture in this PDNA, post-disaster needs assessment framework. And through our courses, we are trying to build guidelines for how culture can be integrated in the post-disaster needs assessment and how we can cost treatments. And if there are no value criteria, if there are no priority lists, what can be done in a crisis situation? Crisis mapping is another important aspect of disaster, uh, disaster response. And tools for crisis mapping are many. They are, uh, again, the wider disaster risk management field has been using uh, uh, crisis mapping tools like Ushahidi or uh, the open street map. When we were supposed to lead, uh, to, to develop action for Haiti, we were without a map. But when we went to Haiti, we discovered that IOM, that is the International Organization for Migration, already had a very good map developed with the help of the communities. And in fact, that map was so useful for us that we realized that crisis mapping is something that we have been, you know, we have not been doing, and we need to do, uh, we need to develop these kind of uh, information sharing tools. And this is a Ushahidi map on the, uh, it's a crisis mapping uh, platform on web, which can receive MMS, SMS, and can do real-time crisis mapping. The other important aspect of our training is 
hands-on training, that's stabilization. It's not full restoration because in a crisis moment you do not have the uh, luxury to do full restoration nor the money or resources. So what can be done just to stabilize and to contain damage? So to that level, we give hands-on training to people and it's very interdisciplinary, it's very... Uh, the, the, they get both for built and collections. Skills for mediation and negotiation and working with communities is another important topic discussed and we bring people who actually work with communities and uh, progressively include such exercises for mediation and negotiation in our courses. There's also this aspect of working with the humanitarians and the military and we do detailed simulations during the course, emergency simulations, where we bring these outside actors and they talk about their interests and how they would like to collaborate with cultural heritage people. So it's a frank discussion, open discussion, and it uh, gives insights to our participants to go and develop similar action at home. The overall aim is to uh, integrate uh, cultural recovery within the development framework or building back better and using cultural heritage for peace. And to illustrate that, we bring uh, case studies from NGOs that have intervened, uh, that have done similar projects in crisis situations all around the world where uh, they have not only helped restore cultural heritage, but also have linked it with the livelihoods of the people. Outcomes of these courses, very quickly, we have now, as a result of all this work that we have done, a training kit on disaster risk, uh, a kind of a book which will be soon online for developing training on disaster risk management of cultural heritage. It has case studies, it has lesson plans, and then uh, an online publication featuring case studies of our participants narrating their experience of protecting cultural heritage in conflict situations. There was also uh, at, uh, one of our participants, uh, former participants from Egypt went back and did a training, and he built his first national team in Egypt. And during the bombing, at the, after the bombing of the, uh, at the Islamic Museum in Cairo, his team was called in to provide first response, which uh, brought us much publicity and also brought good name to, to our training. So we are very grateful to this colleague who's, been, who's doing exceptional work in Egypt. Prince Klaus Fund, uh, and they, they have a program on cultural emergency response. They have uh, given support to ICRAM and to ICRAM uh, participants. They can go back in their countries and hold similar training. And so as a result, we've had seven national teams of first aiders in different countries. These were teams constitu constituted after trainings in those countries. And now we will have another edition. We have new partners. We have Smithsonian institutions and UNESCO National Commission of Netherlands. We will have a course on first aid to cultural heritage in times of crisis, which will be looking at both conflicts and natural disasters. We have participants, 20 participants from 20 different countries, uh, 10 from conflict areas, conflict afflicted areas, and 10 from uh, high uh, risk prone regions in the world. And it'll be a brand new course. And we hope that after this, we will be able to develop systematic action in Latin America and Caribbean region where we have not been so active so thus far. In the end, in conclusion, I would like to highlight that to build resilience for disasters, or to develop communities that are resilient against disasters. Culture is important, it should not be forgotten, and we should work, we should try to make it a part, a centerpiece of the national strategies, our, our national strategies and our international strategy. Thank you so much.